if you have a look at this program in, in Niger that has been running for the last 20 years approximately, so it's, it's uh, situated here, it's working in the areas of between Niamey going up to Tawa and Agadez here, so a rather big area where it is working. I don't have to mention the context very much, most of you will know the, the situation in Sahel countries. So there is a, a rather high population growth, which is in, uh, important, as we will see, with very severe land degradation. Well, high temperature, you know, is still increasing with climate change now. We have declining, less reliable rainfall and severe droughts since the 1970s. And I guess you all know the reports about the impacts of these droughts. Now, the program has been funded by BMZ, that's the German Ministry for Development Cooperation. It has been implemented by the government of Niger together with GIZ and KFW, the, Deve uh, the development bank. Now, between the early 90s and 2010, some more than 400,000 hectares have been treated with different types of soil and water conservation measures. And this with a rhythm of about 20 to 30,000 hectares per year. And on top of that, more than 200 water spreading weirs, and I will explain what it is, have been constructed that sort of have created an irrigated area of about 10,000 hectares. So you don't have to remember all these figures, I only show them to you in order to explain with this approach, large scale impacts are possible. So we are not at a project level. We don't talk about a dozen of villages. We talk about hundreds of villages that we work with. We don't talk about some thousand hectares, we talk about 100,000 and 10,000 of hectares. So it is the, the approach really offers a large scale uh, impact. Now, if you look a little bit at the techniques, that's quite classical. If you look at this transect here, we have the transect, we have the, the plateaus up, up here that are used for livestock, that are used for forestry mainly. Then we have the slopes here, rather degraded. And we have the very important hill foots where all the fields are, the rain fed fields are. And then we have the valley, whoop, how is it going? We have the valley bottoms with the fertile but also very degraded soils down there. So now for each of these landscape units, there are specific types of techniques that are used. And here on the plateaus, it's, it was mainly gnarly trenches that, that were used here. Then on the slopes, different types of techniques were used. In the fields, it was mainly stone bunds and planting pits. And down here in the valleys, it was water spreading weirs, which is a, a newer technique that I will shortly explain afterwards. So different techniques specific to each uh, landscape unit. Now, if you look at the costs, and this is quite important, the costs are very reasonable. So in order to treat here the, the soils on the plateaus, this was at a cost of 130 euros per hectare, which is not that much. If you look at the fields, farmers' fields, you treat them with the at the cost of 30 to 45 euros per hectare. Well, I, and here it's, it's more cost intensive. If you look at the water spreading weirs, 600 to 1,500 euros per hectare, but still quite reasonable. And on top, if you now, if you think about these costs are not uh, taken over by the project, but there's a very strong contribution of the population. So if you take these things here, the Nardi trenches, about 55% of these costs are taken over by the population. If you go to the stone bunds, around 40% of the costs. If you could take, talk about the planting pits, it's even 90% of the costs. It's the population that does most of the work, really. So this is quite important in order to judge these uh, approaches. Now, you also don't look at, the, at all these figures, but what I would like to, you to remember is that we have here a very cost-efficient uh, approach, a very integrated, effective approach, and we have a very strong contribution by the, by the beneficiaries, by the population. So that's important about it. Now, perhaps very quickly, everybody knows what stone bunds are. Perhaps you, you don't know these techniques. These are gnarly trenches, so there you have a special plow behind the tractor. This plow sort of rips the soil open, open which creates micro basins. And these micro basins, a couple of hundred liters of water can be be stored and these micro basins are planted to grasses or to trees and shrubs. So that's how it presents. These water spreading wheels, that's a newer technology. So it's not dams, uh, so it, there are not, not no water reservoirs that are created. But there is a, a flood coming down the, the valley. So these water spreading wheels, they sort of spread the water all over the valley floor. So the water is spread over the soils are Get, get the humidity, the water infiltrates into the soil, and then it goes further down. What is the work approach of this program? 
So the program only intervenes if the village, villages actively ask for it, so there must be some agreement within the village. Then the program takes a rolling approach. It sort of works with 100 villages at a time in parallel. So the first year is used to give a lot of training to organize the, the population, so there are village development committees set up and so on. A lot of training in the first pilot, pilot activities start. Then we have years two to five where the very intensive implementation is carried out. And then we have years five to six where the program progressively disengages and the, the, the uh, responsibility is shifted over to the villages. Population provides free labor, local materials, and the maintenance. Program provides the training, gives tools, material, trucks, and tractors. That's the, the setup. But what is important to remember here is that the people need time. So 100 villages, about six years of intervention. This is because work, labor in the villages, the labor resources in the villages, they are also limited. So villages or farmers only can sort of treat a couple of hectares per year. So their, their resources are limited and the program also needs time because after the first 100 villages, there are another 100 villages. So you have a, an approach where new villages are coming in all the time and other villages become independent and autonomous. Now, let's have a look at some of the important results, and I think this confirms what has already been presented. If we look at the, the work on the, the plateaus, so there we have these herbaceous biomass, which is basically fodder for the animals. So after the treatment, you have yeah, some six to 700 kilograms of biomass, herbaceous biomass that is produced, fodder, basically. If you look at the wood, it's not that much. One steer per hectare, that's about one cubic meter, so not very much, but it's also a very harsh and tough environment. But once the vegetation has established, then biodiversity gets improved, so wildlife comes, comes back to a certain degree and other uh, plant species also re-establish. And of course, once you have the, the vegetation there, the lower areas are protected. Now, if you look at the fields, which is sort of the bulk of the activities, here you have increased yield, so yeah, Crispino already said doubling the yield is no problem. So you can double the yields, that's also our experience. So you have at least 200 kilograms grain more per hectare. And 200 kilograms of grain that uh, corresponds approximately to the need of one person for one year. So treating one hectare with these measures gives you food for one person for one year at a price of 30 to 50 euros per hectare. So this is quite reasonable, I think. But the other effect that the farmers like very much is that they stabilize their yields. This means if there is a dry year, they still will yield something, while other farmers that have not treated their land won't have anything at all. So this is labor intensive, creates employment and income. And there is a very significant increase of the groundwater levels. So access to water, not only for agricultural uses, but also for the for the women especially, is, gets much, much easier. To summarize, significant positive effects on food security, but also on food stability. There is income on, on ecology and on the living conditions in general. What were the external influences about that I talked already? There were some technical innovations and I presented already these water spreading wheels. They were quite important and they started development by the end of the 90s, it took about 10 years to adapt the technology really to the, to, the, to the local conditions. Now it works very nicely and it complements the entire approach. It complements the technological package to treat these valleys. So this was quite nice. Another innovation was also the, the value chain approach. So in the beginning, the, pro, the program focused really on the production side. But when then, with this vegetable production especially, it became more and more interesting to link the farmers up to the markets also to, to, to get some income. So this was positive, a very good opportunity. Then we had some conceptual challenges, and these were quite, I would say, quite, quite risky. This was around the time 2000 to 2004, when German Development Corporation, this means technical corporation, GIZ, underwent a very severe restructuring, so the projects were concentrated into programs. This took uh, quite some time, and it also took quite some, some energy. It was one of the causes why technical cooperation draw out of the program, so this nearly sort of stopped the program. Fortunately, financial cooperation continued with the activities, so this sort of saved the program. This was quite, quite a risk for the program. Later on, technical cooperation came back 
back on, on board. Then in the, at the national level, there was the decentralization policy that became more important than Niger. And well, it was decided that bilateral German development cooperation should focus on the decentralization sector. So there was a decentralization program that was started and you can perhaps imagine the gymnastics that were necessary in order to integrate now this very rather large soil and water conservation program into a decentralization program. This was not easy and it was also quite lucky that it sort of, yeah, that it was possible finally. And the funny thing, it, it worked out quite well. It worked out quite well because, yeah, Sally mentioned it, these municipalities, they finally integrated these natural resource management activities into their municipal development plans. So it went, went quite well in the end. There were several institutional changes. Well, Niger, uh, in the last 20 years, there were several new governments. There were, I don't know, at least two military coups or three even. So each time there were, were changes in the ministries, of course. So the, the, the institutional setup changed the program. Sometimes it was sort of linked up with the, with the Ministry of, um, of Planning. Then it was linked up with the Ministry of Agriculture. Finally, it was linked up with the, the Office of the President. So there were some hiccups, this all takes energy, but luckily all the activities on the ground, they always kept on going. Well, climate change came up. This was around 2007 when the, 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 the subject came up in the program. This was, but not a problem, this was rather an opportunity because I think these, the activities that are carried out, this is climate change adaptation, also mitigation par excellence. These measures that are carried out, they stabilize the production, they increase the production, they give income and so on. So no problem at this one. And then a very major problem right from the beginning of the program until today, this is the growing population really. The population of Niger grows with a, at a rate of 3.3%, which means that we can produce a lot more food now through the, these measures they are quite successfully. But basically this food is used to nourish uh, an increasing population it's not really sufficient to increase the, um, the quality of life of the individual. So that's the main challenge, I guess. So I would say as a conclusion here, especially external challenges created risks, but also sometimes opportunities. It was not the internal processes. Now, some of the conclusions, I think landscape approaches offer multiple benefits. They are very powerful and low cost concept to improve food security and incomes. They have very positive environmental effects like on biodiversity, on, on water availability. And they are very suitable to mainstream climate change adaptation and mitigation. They have the potential to have large scale, to be scaled up really. And they also improve the governments in rural areas by involving all these stakeholders and by integrating the know-how across the different sectors. People from different sectors have to work together and they really mobilize and strengthen the capacities of the local population here. Now, what, do, what are requirements? What are success factors of such programs? And it was already mentioned before. I think the participatory bottom-up approach was, was essential uh, and the involvement of all these stakeholders. We also, we use a multi-level approach, which means that we try, we have some activities at the national level in order to get the, the policy and legal framework right in order, this gives us the liberty to strongly implement at, a, at the, the middle, the meso level and the micro level where most of the activities take place. I think such programs in order to become successful, they have to be implemented medium and long term, which requires a very strong political will. And as I showed you the several risks that come up when you, let's say new hypes of development cooperation come up, new subjects come up and everybody runs after these new hypes. And this sometimes bring these pro brings these programs into under, under risks. Well, food availability per capita can only be improved if population growth is not too high. So ideally, such programs should be accompanied by some other programs that talk about demography. Thank you very much. <laughs>